Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this fireside chat. Uh, I hope everyone's been having a good day so far. Um, so the first thing before I give our wonderful speakers our the intro bio, uh, I just want to let you know that you can type in questions in the live discussion uh, part uh, in the event. So just go into swap card, click the event, and there should be a place for questions. Uh, we've got 10 minutes for questions at the end, and you can start putting in your questions already now. We'll prioritize the ones with the most upvotes. So if you see a good question on there, give it some votes so um, it will come up in the start. All right. Okay, so we're going to start by introducing our speakers. So Hayden uh, Belfield uh, has been a research associate and academic pro project manager at the University of Cambridge's Center for the Study of Ex Existential Risk for the past five years. Uh, in that time, the center tripled in size and he's advised the UK, US and Singaporean governments, the EU, UN and OECD and leading technology companies. Uh, Lord Martin Rees uh, co-founded the Center for the Study of Existential Risk with Huyu Price and Jan Talon and services on the Scientific uh, Ad Advisory Board for the Future of Life Institute in addition to being a member of several other boards. He's a fellow for, of Trinity College and professor of cosmology and astrophysics at the University of Cambridge. Formerly the Master of Trinity College and President of the Royal Society, Reese's extensive experience engaging with policymakers and the public to better prepare for our long-term challenges. His legacy in the field of astrophysics and beyond is remarkable and continues to inspire young scientists around the world. Give them a warm round of applause. <laughs> Great, thank you uh, so much for that, and thank you so much, Martin, for, for being here. We've got uh, some uh, great questions to be getting into, um, and thanks for people who have submitted them already on Twitter. Please do submit away on, on, on Swapcard. Um, so m my uh, first engagement with Martin's work was uh, a book you wrote, uh, uh, Our Final uh, Century, which uh, renamed Our Final Hour in the US, <laughs> because you've got to be more uh, urgent in the US market. Uh, uh, I remember reading that and being fascinated by uh, existential risk, and you've continued to do, you know, produce these uh, fascinating books. With the one on the end of astronauts, um, I think that was last year, and then the most recent one, uh, if science is to save us, uh, how you know science can't just be left in the lab, but has to be democratically debated in uh, in society more general. So thinking about Martin's work uh, on the you know, the Big Bang, uh, astrophysics, and, and, and so on. I'm remain, reminded of the, the famous joke, which is that there's these two astrophysicists discussing their research in a bar one evening, and this drunk person who has been listening in slurs over and is like, wait, 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 what was that you just said? And they said, oh, we were discussing stellar evolution, and, uh, and I said to my colleague that the sun would run out of nuclear fuel, and turn, no, nuclear fuel and turn into a red giant star in about five billion years. And the drunk goes, oh, thank God, I thought you said five million. Um, and, uh, it remind, and it makes me think of a similar thing for existential risk where we could say, wait, the drunk could overhear someone talking about existential risk and say, wait, did you just say, what, how, what's the risk of human extinction in the next 10 years? Oh, we said it was 0.1%. Oh, thank God, I thought you said it was 1%. Oh, problem solved. Um, so I thought I wanted to start with some questions uh, kind of on the intersection of space and existential risk. So firstly, uh, you've argued that Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking are wrong to think that colonizing Mars could be a good way to reduce existential risk and a good way to have a backup. Uh, you said it's a dangerous delusion. Uh, why is that? Yes. Well, first of all, let me plug my uh, new book uh, with uh, John Goldsmith called The End of Astronauts, uh, which discusses uh, the case for astronauts. Um, and um, uh, the point we make is that as robots get better, the practical case for sending humans to assemble structures, to build things on the moon, or to go to Mars, etc., <clears throat> is getting weaker, because already we've got uh, entities on Mars, the Perseverance probe, etc., which can, can um, uh, move around, navigate, but it can't do geology, but its, uh, its success is in two years, 
well, 20 years anyway, we'll be able to do the geology. So the practical case for sending humans is getting weaker, and the cost, of course, is hugely greater to send uh, a human to uh, Mars and bring them back safely. Um, that's uh, hugely more expensive than to send robots. Um, and um, uh, especially if one is as risk averse as a body like NASA has to be. So our line is that the case for sending humans to Mars is very weak if you are risk averse. But on the other hand, I think we should cheer on the billionaires if they send the kind of people prepared to take a high risk and go on a one-way trip. And of course, as you say, Elon Musk says he wants to uh, die on Mars, but not on impact. And 40 years from now, good luck to him. He might be able to do this. And um, uh, it's a great adventure, but I don't think there's any case for sending, spending taxpayers' money on sending people to Mars, or even to the moon, because um, machines can do all the practical things of assembling structures and doing science. So, but one of the arguments that they give is that this could create like a backup on... Ah, Mars. okay. Is, is that, that's a... Yes. Uh, well, I mean, let me expand a bit on this scenario. Um, I, I think that uh, if the uh, billionaires send a few uh, people, thrill seekers, to Mars, then by the end of a century, there will be some sort of uh, uh, community living on Mars. In hostile conditions, which are very small. Uh, which, which are very dangerous. Um, and those people, I think, will be important. And uh, I guess they're relevant to what Anders was talking about this morning, uh, in that um, they will use all the ad advances of uh, uh, cyborg and biotechnology to adapt themselves and their progeny to this very hostile environment. And indeed, uh, the post-human era whether it's to produce post-humans who are flesh and blood or electronic, that may be generated by these few people who choose to live on Mars. So they can be <clears throat> of great importance cosmically. But to answer the question, um, I think it's a dangerous delusion to think that humans in large numbers will ever want to settle on Mars um, because um, it will be less comfortable to live on Mars uh, than to live at the South Pole or at the bottom of the ocean on the Earth. So um, although um, uh, some adventurers may want to go, I don't think any um, people will want to go if they're just ordinary people. And uh, um, the point I would make is that um, to uh, terraform Mars is far, far harder than to deal with climate change on the Earth. So it's crazy to say we want to escape the problem of climate change by terraforming Mars. Uh, so to, uh, to stay on the kind of this theme, uh, yes. one of the uh, risks, one of the big existential risks that maybe people will be familiar mm -hmm. with is kind of asteroids. Uh, people are familiar yes. with killing the dinosaurs, uh, deep impact in Armageddon yes, in the yes. 90s mm -hmm. and so on. So this is a question from Zachary uh, Callenborn on uh, Twitter mm -hmm. who asked, um, about defending the Earth from near-Earth objects and asteroids mm -hmm. and so on. Should this be a civilian thing? Should this be a military mission? Should this be, you know, a lot of the asteroid mining that people are talking about is going to be private companies? Yes. Who, uh, what, who uh, which should have responsibility? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, when people know I'm an astronomer, uh, they think that the risks I most worry about would be asteroid impacts. But in fact, they don't keep me awake at night at all, really because the likelihood of uh, asteroid impacts is no higher now than it was a million years ago or a thousand years ago. And moreover, uh, the risk can be calibrated because we've got a pretty complete survey of all the uh, asteroids that are there. So we know what the risk is. And uh, indeed, it's a non-zero risk, um, something like the uh, uh, huge asteroid impact that kills dinosaurs uh, is going to happen every two, um, ten million years probably. Um, and uh, smaller um, impacts will occur much more often once every few centuries. Um, but uh, they're not the kind of risks that are high on our list. 
because they're not getting it any bigger. Um, but of course, um, you may have seen there was a, a rather good experiment that was done by um, NASA just uh, a month or so ago, where they found um, two asteroids. One was about the size of a football field, and the other was smaller, orbiting around it. And um, they uh, uh, sent a spacecraft weighing about a tonne, which crashed into the smaller of these two asteroids. Um, and um, uh, this was interesting because it was um, possible to detect the effect and the orbit which this small asteroid had about its large companion changed its period. And that therefore told them how much the momentum of that object had been changed. And therefore, how much would you deflect the asteroid if it was coming for us? Um, and uh, it was rather interesting that they were able to detect the effect. And incidentally, the effect was surprisingly big mm -hmm. because um, uh, the momentum uh, was not just the momentum of this spacecraft crashing, but the, the crash dislodged a thousand times the mass of asteroid material as a recoil. And so the actual uh, nudge that was given to the asteroid was a thousand times more than just the momentum. And so this is very surprising. And this does mean that it is feasible, if you have a bit of warning, to deflect these um, asteroids of that sort of size, um, but n not the really big ones. Um, uh, so in, in the introduction, yes. it was mentioned that you're the uh, Astronomer Royal. Um, yes. I think the 15th, <laughs> I think it stretches back to the 1700s yes, yes. and mm. Edmund Halley and so on. Um, uh, what role does the Astronomer Royal, <laughs> <laughs> what, is it, what does it mean day to day for you? Yeah, yes. Um, well, I like to say cynically that the duties are so ambiguous that I can do them posthumously. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> Um, but, um, uh, but more seriously, um, the Astronomer Royal was the person who directed the Royal Grange Observatory, which was set up in 1675, and was probably the most, or the first, serious government-supported scientist. Mm. And I like to say that uh, uh, astronomy was the first branch of science to become professionalised, um, apart maybe from medicine. Yeah. And I would say perhaps it was the first kind of science to do more good than harm. <laughs> uh, any doctors in the audience perhaps, I hope they don't mind me saying that. Um, but um, uh, uh, the museum, sorry, sorry the uh, science um, done at the Greenwich Observatory uh, really stopped in about 1960 uh, because the London weather was not the best place to put in a telescope, and it only had rather ancient uh, equipment there. And of course, we started to be able to fly routinely to uh, telescopes on mountain tops in the Canary Islands, Hawaii, and Australia, and Chile, and places like that. Um, and the title of Astronomer Royal um, was kept, but was no longer the person who ran the Greenwich Observatory, which was. Uh, now a museum. And it's a good place to go and visit, and you see all the chronometers and all that, but there's no science done there. So the title is just a, a, t a title which is kept like the Poet Laureate as a sort of a, um, honorary one. And uh, I used to sometimes get asked, did I do the Queen's horoscopes? <laughs> and uh, I had to say that uh, um, I was never asked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> For the king, I wonder but whether he, he yes, might have a bit more interest know. in that. Yeah. yeah no, I think uh, I have talked to him, of course, but about uh, the environment, etc. But uh, I don't think he will ask me either. <laughs> yeah. Do you think the position should come to an end, do you th or do you think it should continue another 100, 200 years? Um, well, I think it's it's a very minor matter whether it continues or not, um, and uh, um, I, I suppose it it's good to have someone whose job it is to sort of uh, bang on about the importance and interest mm -hmm. of science and the broad way. And of course, if we think about astronomy, um, <coughs> it's a, a subject which uh, uh, does uh, attract uh, young people. Uh, of course, um, some sciences have an ambivalent uh, reputation because say, nuclear science and genetics have downsides as well as uh, benefits. Whereas I think um, uh, two things which fascinate young people and have a positive image are 
space and astronomy on the one hand, and dinosaurs on the other. <laughs> uh, those are two, two uh, things which fascinate young people, and I think uh, to um, get young people keen on those and then uh, hope that teachers will build on it to uh, uh, develop other kinds of science. And the sad thing, of course, that the teaching which is available to the average kids uh, is not good enough to ensure that they maintain their enthusiasm mm -hmm. uh, at secondary school age. Yeah. And of course, what is very sad is that a lot of uh, uh, kids drop science at age 16 because they are turned off by the way it's taught. Mm. And that therefore means that they can't qualify to enter a good university course at age 18. And um, uh, this is certainly one reason why um, as a digression, it's very important to have a different curriculum, like the, the baccalaureate, that doesn't cause people to specialise and drop subjects like mm. science at age uh, 16. Um, so one, uh, so to, uh, to step away from kind of the space, one existential risk that people will be, uh, one global risk that people will be unfortunately familiar with is, <laughs> over the last few years, is pandemics. Um, you made this very famous bet with Steven Pinker that's been described as the... Uh, the, the bet of the century uh, on uh, bioaeroterror. Could you tell us a bit about that, about that bet? <clears throat> yes, well, uh, in my, um, my, my earlier books, um, right back to 2003 when I wrote this book, uh, Final Century, um, I, I did talk about the, the risk of uh, what I call bioaeror or bioterror. This was engineered viruses released by accident or uh, with intention. Um, and um, there's something called the, um, the Long Bet, which are run by the Long Now Foundation, which you may have heard about, Stuart Brand's <coughs> outfit in California. Um, and um, uh, I made a bet that there would be a billion deaths due to an episode of bioerror or bioterror by 2020. And of course, uh, by 2020, um, we did have the pandemic. Um, but the phrasing of the bet meant that I would only win if the bet was um, uh, related to an episode of bioterror, by terror, bio terror. Um, and uh, of course, as you know, it's been controversial uh, whether it was a leakage from the Wuhan laboratory or whether it was a natural pandemic, mm. uh, which, um, as you know, is an open debate. It's still, still going on. Um, and um, uh, Stephen Pinker, uh, three or four years ago had uh, taken up the bet because, uh, uh, as you probably know, he's a great optimist. I mean, he's, uh, he writes these great books and he quite rightly tells us the ways in which things are better. He has all these graphs about the um, uh, infant mortality, um, uh, average uh, money per GNP and literacy and all that, mm -hmm. showing how things are better. Um, but he, in my view, always downplays the fact that there are new types of threat which are getting worse and worse. Mm. Um, the whole agenda of our CSIR, for, CSIR, for instance, um, is um, something which uh, um, is a new thing to worry about, which makes life more difficult for people. Um, so anyway, he bet uh, the other way from me. And of course, we, um, we then discussed who had won the bet, which did depend on whether it was a lab leakage or not. And um, in fact, we wrote a joint article in New Statesman about 18 months ago, um, explaining the situation and all that. Um, and uh, we decided that we would not settle the bet, we would leave it open. And we said something which uh, was rather controversial, perhaps, which was um, that we thought it might be better never to know it was a leakage from the lab if it was. And the reason for that is that if the tragedy had a villain, as it were, mm. then this would make international relations, particularly between the US and China, even more toxic than they are already. And so, uh, uh, so we, we thought that if it did happen to be a le leakage, um, it's best if we never know for definitely, if that's mm. the case. And that was rather controversial. But I mean, to, to, on the other hand, if we did know that it was from uh, that some sort of lab leakage, this would uh, maybe give a boost to efforts to in improve biosafety at these Ab labs. Absolutely, because I, I think uh, quite apart from the origin of uh, COVID-19, um, my worst nightmare actually is indeed um, uh, engineered pandemics. Mm. Um, because um, uh, unlike 
making an H bomb, which you can't do without kind of a conspicuous facilities which can be monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency. Um, these can be done, engineered viruses with gain of function experiments can be done using the kind of equipment that's available in university labs and industry, etc. And I think this is a very scary possibility. Yeah. Um, of course, you have to ask, would anyone have the motive to do this sort of thing? Um, I think terrorists with a well-defined aim wouldn't, just as governments haven't used bioweapons very much. Um, but uh, my worst nightmare is, for instance, some uh, environmental fanatic who thinks there are too many human beings in the world and says, let's get rid of quite a lot of them. It doesn't matter who we kill. And someone like that uh, could um, release a um, virus which is engineered to be more virulent and more transmissible than its natural counterpart. That's a, a real worry. Um, and um, uh, I, I think that's a possibility. And it seems to me that if we want to make the world safe against that sort of scenario, we have to uh, think about the tension between three things we want to preserve, uh, which is um, uh, liberty, security, and privacy. And I think uh, if we want to be sure, we have to give up some privacy mm -hmm. and accept that we need a far higher level of surveillance in order to ensure that there isn't some bad actor, as it were. And uh, we obviously, most of us don't want to give up privacy, but I think the stakes are so high that uh, we're going to all have to give up more so that we can't clandestinely be in a small group that uh, uh, creates a deadly virus. So just to push back on that a little bit, mm -hmm. I mean, the biggest bioweapons programs have been state ones. So the, the Soviet bioweapons program, yes, yes. biggest mm -hmm. in history, secret for you know, 20 yeah, years, yeah. Mm -hmm. produced. Mm -hmm. they, um, they had uh, refrigerated warheads on the top of missiles that they would put the smallpox in uh, mm -hmm. you know, so that it would, keep, um, it would be kept in like, mm -hmm. uh, perfect refrigerated conditions for when it hit mm -hmm. uh, DC. You are more concerned about small groups rather than like if, if, yes. if that started again in, in earnest, like yes, really yes, big state yes, bioweapons yes. programs? Um, well, I mean, I think it's less likely, mm. for the reason I mentioned, that, that, uh, that they would release yeah, um, right. a, a virus um, because they couldn't predict whether it spread globally yeah. or not. It wouldn't just kill the people who they were trying to kill. Mm. Um, it's not like a chemical weapon, right. which can, of course, be limited in its range. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there's a genuine concern about chemical weapons being used. But I think the chance of a nation using a uh, uh, biological weapon is not as great as uh, mm -hmm. some other fanatic using it. So, uh, the, okay, so it's about yeah. the use. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it was 50 years ago, last year, that the Biological Weapons Convention became international law and mm -hmm. the uh, Anti-Ballistic <laughs> Missile Treaty, the first kind of limit on nuclear yeah. weapons. Um, so some of that was attributable to the involvement of um, you know, concerned scientists around the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists mm -hmm. around, and around <laughs> the Pugwash Conferences. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you say a, a bit about your involvement with the, the Pugwash Conferences? Um, yes. Um, uh, well, of course, um, I'm of an age when I was a student in the 1960s, and uh, I remember going on CND demonstrations, uh, even back at the time of the Cuba crisis, etc. So um, I've had a sort of engagement with these, these issues. Um, and uh, uh, in the 70s and 80s, um, I did get involved in the Pugwash conferences, which, uh, um, as you may not all know, but they were uh, meetings um, of um, scientists, mainly from the Soviet Union and from the West, um, who, meet, who met um, to discuss disarmament um, and um, maintain contact even in the depth of the Cold War between East and West. Um, and uh, I got involved in some of this in the um, 70s and 80s. Yeah. And the reason I did that was that the people who set up the Pogwas Conference uh, were um, people who were uh, involved in the, H in the atomic bomb and H-bomb uh, in World War II, um, or radar, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, uh, people like, well, you may know the names of Hans Bethe, um, Rudy Piles, uh, Joe Rothblatt, and people like that. Um, and uh, um, I hugely admired those people because uh, they, they were people who'd uh, worked on making the bomb, um, but then they returned to civilian life after 
the end of the war, um, but uh, um, they felt they had an obligation to do all they could to campaign to control the powers they had helped to unleash. Mm. And uh, that's why they devoted time to, the, um, uh, to, to these campaigns for arms control, uh, partly by Pugwash. But they were all getting old. And it did strike me that it would be very sad if uh, uh, when they had all passed on, uh, there weren't scientists who had the same sort of ideals. And so that's how I joined. Of course, people of my generation and, of course, younger generations than me uh, never had the same hands-on component uh, uh, experience of building um, bombs, etc., which they had in World War II. Um, but I think it's important that all scientists, and I discuss in my book, um, should feel an obligation to ensure that any discovery they're involved in is used benignly and not in a dangerous way. And in fact, um, uh, another uh, very well-known scientist of a slightly later generation who was involved in Pugwash was Michael Atiyah, a great mathematician. And he was president of Pugwash, and he had a rather nice analogy. He said that uh, um, if, if you, uh, if you uh, are a parent and you have teenage kids, then you can't really control very well what they're doing. But you're a poor, poor parent if you don't care what happens to them. <laughs> and in the same way, if you've uh, made some discovery, you may not have huge influence in controlling how it's applied. You're a poor uh, scientist if you don't care and don't try and ensure that any discovery is used benevolently and don't um, warn politicians of possible dangers and downsides. Mm. So I think it's useful for people in this... That's uh, a long answer. No, 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 I know. Yeah, I, yeah, I, okay. I really enjoy yeah. um, so, And what I, I like about it is that I think for people in this room and for people involved in existential risk for the last few years, mm. I think there can be a sense that this is like completely new, just invented from scratch, like no one's ever thought <coughs> of this stuff before. <coughs> and I think it could be quite useful to think, you know, mm. no, there was this generation in the 40s and 50s, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. this, second, this uh, second generation in the 60s and 70s. Yes, and those who work on, uh, on biology, of course, um, yeah. uh, it's very important they do all they can to ensure that we can protect against the misuse of their, their technology. And uh, they uh, need to be concerned about uh, the use of bioweapons. But also, there are all kinds of ethical concerns, of course, which we know uh, can stem from uh, all these advanced in genetics, etc. Yeah. And uh, it's clear that um, all scientists have a responsibility to engage with ethicists on those. And, of course, that's one thing that is within the CISO agenda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like... I, to my mind, one of the successes of the Pugwash thing is that it focused so much on this like, very small group of you know, top-level scientists and policymakers. Um, however, you know, even though you're, you know, you're in the House of Lords, you, you're in many ways like the insider's insider, you've argued that, we sh that the, you, it can't just be left to these kinds of like, uh, narrow things, that there needs to be, you need to bring the public in and you need to make people aware of these risks. Can you, well, why is that? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think um, uh, in all the case of uh, long-term issues, then, of course, it's hard to make politicians prioritise them mm. unless they think the public cares. And, of course, uh, um, the, the um, issues that uh, pugwash-type bodies are concerned mm. with, the, the small probability of something really catastrophic, uh, which uh, may never happen and is unlikely to happen within the term of office of a particular politician. Those are the hard things to get the public to take seriously, and even harder to get politicians to take seriously. Mm. Uh, so uh, th that's something which we, we really want to help with. And um, I think it's um, uh, the issue which comes up in the climate change, for right. instance, because in the, the public um, uh, expect politicians to react sharply to something like COVID-19, and of course they did. Um, they they groped for what was the right thing to do and then tried to do it. Um, but uh, uh, things like climate change, um, where we have fairly confident views of scenarios that will follow from uh, uh, business as usual, etc., um, it's rather hard to get politicians to prioritise it because they need to be convinced that the public cares. So scientists, as I say, uh, like the Pugwash scientists, they have an obligation to talk to politicians, but 
I know a lot of scientists who have been government advisors, and they tend to feel they don't get very much traction mm. because the politicians have more urgent things to think about. But the politicians will respond if they know that the public cares. And that's why I think, and I say in my new book, uh, that we should welcome um, charismatic figures who do uh, engage the public and make the public care. Um, and I quote a, a disparate quartet of um, Pope Francis, David Attenborough, Bill Gates, and Greta Thornburg. Very different people from each other, but all in their different ways. Uh, they've done a lot to uh, uh, raise public awareness of these long-term issues and uh, remind people that we've got to avoid leaving a world for our grandchildren that's depleted compared to our present-day world, etc. And that has made uh, the public uh, take care mm. and made the um, uh, politicians respond more positively than they do. Uh, and that book is If Science Is To Save Us, available in all uh, good bookshops. Um, on climate change, what do you think the UK's role should be on a world stage? Should it be like being a role model and reducing our emissions as quickly as possible, or should it be kind of investing in clean energy R&D? Um, well, I think both of those things yeah. to do. But, but I think what, what, what's very important is that um, if it's feasible for us to uh, go to net zero for this country. Um, but of course, we've got to bear in mind that uh, if you think 2050, uh, then um, there'll be four billion people in the global south, this is India and sub-Saharan Africa, etc. That's a, a billion people more in those regions than there are now. And those people are going to need more per capita energy than they have now. We can get by with less per capita energy. Uh, in our lives. Um, and so uh, what we've got to do is ensure that those countries of the global south mm. can leapfrog directly to clean energy in order to provide the extra energy they need, um, just as they leapfrog directly to smartphones and never had landlines. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would say that we in the in the UK and um, countries in the global north um, uh, need to prioritize cheaper and more effective clean energy and all the things that go with it, energy storage, yeah. um, global grids and things of that kind. Um, and this is not just for uh, our own uh, targets, but also to make it feasible by collaborating with the global south for them to meet their targets. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, uh, and I think unless we can do that, then, of course, the uh, CO2 emissions in 2050 from those 4 billion people is going to be as many as it is from now, uh, from um, the northern countries now. And uh, we won't be anywhere near global net zero. Mm. Mm. So, so I think we've got to really um, prioritize the um, uh, production of more efficient and cheaper clean energy systems. Um. Okay, that's very really interesting. We had a number of questions from people, uh, so from Carl Robichaud, from Anders Sandberg and others, just basically on the theme of uh, where is the existential risk community going wrong? So, um, so first of all, maybe like, uh, what, are, what do you think are some of the, are there risks that you think are understudied, like that the existential risk community uh, is kind of ignoring? Yeah. Um, well, I think they're, they've got a pretty comprehensive list, of yeah, course, right, right, right. Uh, but I think in Priorities. I mean, uh, uh, we've got to think between the the, one, the natural ones like asteroids, earthquakes, and volcanoes, mm. uh, which can be very serious, and of course can be more serious than they were in the past because there's more infrastructure which is vulnerable, which they can destroy. But on the whole, they are not getting more likely mm. than they were, uh, and that's why um, I think we worry most about. Uh, uh, misuses of biotech and, uh, and of course, AI, etc. cetera. Um, and and um, I, I think um, the only respect in which I probably have a different set of priorities uh, than most is that there's, there's huge um, uh, concern about um, misuse of AI and the AI mm -hmm. taking over and yeah. the, the alignment problem and all that, um, which, which is a serious worry. I'm not disparaging that. Um, but I think we should also worry about um, simply 
breakdowns, you know, bugs in the system mm. and uh, us becoming so dependent on global networks uh, that when things break down, um, it causes a, um, a cascading catastrophe which can't be dealt with. So I, I worry uh, m more about uh, dependence mm. on complicated uh, networks and systems um, which uh, break down in ways that we, we don't have enough skilled people to sort out very quickly. Uh, so, so I think uh, it's just a vulnerability which is growing um, and this is the, machi the machines going wrong rather than the machines outwitting us. Right, right, yeah. okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a, like particular like uh, works or people or ideas that you think uh, people that you want people to be more familiar with around that issue? Um, well, I mean, I, I'm diffident because I'm not an expert in this, but uh, uh, I do feel it's important to have a redundancy and, uh, uh, and avoid having uh, too much interconnection so that um, uh, these cascades can be, can be avoided. Um, and, and obviously to be aware that there can be these, uh, these hidden bugs in the system mm -hmm. that, uh, which, we're, we're having a, uh, which we're becoming aware of very much for the, the chat and all that. Mm. Um, so, so I think uh, to make sure that there's a deep concern to avoid those risks. Because they're what I worry about. Because we know we, know we could easily have a system whereby uh, one um, can get... Um, can, can cause a global catastrophe. And incidentally, when I talked about uh, my number one threat um, at the moment being uh, misuse of uh, biotech and engineered viruses, I should have mentioned, of course, that cyber attacks um, can, be, uh, can be more serious. Mm. Um, and um, uh, one point I make in my book is that um, uh, back in 2012, uh, there was a document put out by the American State Department about the effect of a state-level cyber attack on the American uh, electricity grid, mm. or the East Coast electricity grid, uh, saying it could be so serious, I quote, to merit a nuclear response. And that was a very scary thing. And doubly scary because the kind of cyber attack which needed a state-level uh, perpetrator in the past could probably be done by uh, a few lone actors aided by uh, AI. Mm. And so I, I think uh, uh, I, I should have said when I mentioned um, uh, bio threats that cyber threats are just as serious. So I, I think um, our dependence in an interconnected world right. on, on those two technologies is something which does worry me enormously. Is it, just interestingly on that, um, the UK and US recently said that they won't use AI in their nuclear command and control. They won't be automating nuclear response, which is one of those things where it's like reassuring that they say it, but it's also kind of not reassuring that they feel they need to say it. Well, absolutely. <laughs> no, I completely, I completely agree. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, so we've got some questions from the audience. So one of them is that uh, I think in uh, our final century, um, uh, from 2003, you, you gave uh, human civilization a 50% chance of surviving the 21st century. So yeah. since we're coming up on, uh, you know, being a quarter through this century, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, do you still, uh, are you, is that still your best guess, 50%? Um, well, I think I would um, take, take that as um, uh, a very rough guess. <laughs> but, but, I, but I would say two things. Um, I would say that um, uh, we are going to have a bumpy ride through this century. I mean, these mm. things we've been discussing, yeah. I think we're not going to escape them all. Uh, so I do think we, have, we will have um, setbacks, which could indeed be a setback to civilization because we are so interconnected uh, that uh, uh, we can't have an effect on one continent without it spreading globally. Um, you may know Jared Diamond's book called Collapse, where he talks about yep. local collapses in different parts of the world. Um, it's not like that now uh, because we um, uh, have a spread of any any sort of catastrophe around the world, uh, which, which is something which makes everything more worrying. Um, but of course, um, wiping everyone out is rather unlikely to conceive. We can think of things that would, but in general, to wipe everyone out. Uh, but that's uh, a huge setback to civilization. And uh, to be sort of semi-frivolous, um, what st would strike me as um, a, a really disastrous outcome would be if one um, uh, imagines that nearly everyone in the world is killed, and the few people survive on some 
South Sea Island, and those people are um, a few of the indigenous people and a few people like Peter Thiel. <laughs> and, and if you imagine that the future of the human race and its revival depends on that combination, it's Peter something Thiel to dread, I think. I, uh, <laughs> yes. I, had, I, had a, I had a piece, yeah, yeah. In, uh, I had a piece in, in Vox a couple of weeks ago about Peter Thiel, uh, and it's, there's a story about uh, one of my uh, friends traveling around the South Island and is having a drink in a pub, and they say, uh, oh yeah, come out here, come out here. You see that house up on the hill? That's Peter Thiel's house. <laughs> if there's ever a problem, that's where we're going to go for food and water. <laughs> so I don't yes, think, yes, yes. Uh, you know, I don't think yeah, the yeah. butthole is going to work. Yes, um, yeah, these survivalists are going down yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah. in New um, Zealand. Yeah. Yeah, you can't, yeah, you can't do it on your own, yeah. right? Because mm -hmm. the, the idea that you, one person could just like create their own bunker and survive yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. seems... Uh, so we've got another question, which is, um, you've talked about the democratic... Um, uh, the democratic oversight, democratic engagement with science, what should that look like? Should that look more like, you know, like citizen juries mm -hmm. and things like that, um, like uh, that have been used, I think, for GM foods in Denmark mm -hmm. or uh, abortion. There's been some attempts to do some things like that on climate change, I think, in France. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how do you envisage this, have, this working? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think as a general dictum, it's important that uh, the way science is applied is not a matter just for scientists. It's got to be... Uh, uh, the result of engagement with the public and, and the risks and the potentialities and the ethics. And uh, uh, that has to be done um, in um, uh, all these areas. I mean, for the environment, um, the public has to be aware of this. And to take one example of that, um, uh, when Mr. Gove was environmental minister, um, he um, proposed this legislation um, to avoid the uh, reuse of um, uh, drinking no, to avoid non-reusable drinking straws mm -hmm. made of plastic and things like that. And uh, this was to reduce pollution of the ocean. And he did that because, thanks to David Attenborough's programs, people were aware of the uh, uh, downside of uh, ocean pollution. There was the iconic picture of the uh, albatross returning to its nest and coughing up for its young bits of plastic, not the long for nourishment, you know. And that's an iconic picture, rather like the uh, polar bear on the ice flow is for the um, uh, climate uh, co campaign. And so uh, th that's, that's an example where um, the, the public does have an effect. But I think going back to citizen juries and things, yeah. in fact, yeah. I, I was talking just last week to um, Anna Middleton, who's in the education department and at, uh, at the Wellcome Trust, um, who's um, got a program to do um, citizens' juries and did one recently um, on, um, on genetic modification. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, there's these single gene diseases like uh, um, Huntington's disease, etc. Um, and also there's a, uh, the possibility of uh, human enhancement through genetic modification and, 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 and CRISPR-Cas9 and yeah. all that. And so that's an example where uh, one wants uh, to test public opinion mm -hmm. by having a sample of people there. So I think citizen joys are, are important. Um, and also... Um, parliamentary discussions as well yeah. on, on, on these. But uh, um, there are more and more ethical issues which are going to arise from biology. Um, about um, uh, one thing, in fact, I got an article coming out on assisted dying, for instance. Um, and I think the issue about um, um, the, the ethics of the beginning and end of life and all that, mm -hmm. uh, these are things which are um, matters where everyone has an opinion and all their opinions should be of equal value, and the, the experts are not those who should dominate the way things are done. On that, like, how do you think about... So, you know, your position gives you a lot of room to do kind of advocacy on different issues and different ways of doing that. How do you think about, uh, you know, doing things in Parliament, talking to people directly, you know, encouraging scientists and companies, or reaching out to the public? How do you feel about different things like that, and then how do you feel about issues that you prioritise? You know, if it's mm -hmm. science funding, assisted dying, attention to existential risks, mm -hmm. yeah, how do, you, how do you feel about prioritising? Do you just take the opportunities as they come sort of thing, or...? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, uh, well, we, in, in CESA, we probably have a view that uh, some of the issues we are working on are more serious and more urgent mm -hmm. than others, and I think we, we can decide which we bang on about most, as right. it were. <laughs> um, but uh, to have an effect, then we've got to work through politicians mm. or through the wider public indirectly and voters. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've, we've got, got to do that. Um, but um, I, I think we, we just 
got to um, do it whichever way we can. We've got to accept that mm. uh, some, some people are very, very good at getting through to the wider public, mm. and uh, they should do it, whereas uh, um, some of our colleagues are uh, relatively catatonic and they, <laughs> uh, and, and they can't help so much. <laughs> and so I think uh, people are going to their strengths, but I think mm -hmm. uh, we've got to make sure that the uh, um, influence and the knowledge of the uh, implications of science are spread widely. But uh, um, we shouldn't expect everyone to do public outreach in the same way. Some yeah. are good at it, some are bad at it. But we've got to encourage, and we've got to respect very much those who do it successfully, whether right. it's through the media, etc. cetera. Mm. Um, just this is the, not particularly related, but yeah. an interesting question. What's the most unexpected societal or technological change you've witnessed over your career? Um, well, I mean, I suppose um, it's very interesting to think of how uh, particularly innovations happen. And in most cases, they, uh, they, they go um, not exponentially, but like a sigmoid curve. They go up and then they level off. Just two familiar examples. Um, uh, in 1919, there was um, uh, Alcock and Brown's first transatlantic flight. Fifty years after that, we had the jumbo jet, 1969. Now, it's more than 50... 50 years after the first jumbo jet, we still have the jumbo jet, more or less. Uh, so the, uh, the changes w went very fast and then slower. Um, and uh, um, if you take space flight, it was only 12 years from the first Sputnik to the uh, uh, first man on the moon. Uh, and, uh, and I'm old enough to remember the first man on the moon. Um, and at the time, I thought there'd be people on Mars mm. 10 years later, but still, um, that's the high point. Uh, so, so things go, go at different speeds. But to answer your question directly, um, I think the, it's the, um, um, the impact of, of IT and smartphones and all that, oh, really? um, which, which has, um, has gone globally mm. in the last 10 or 15 years. I think the, the, the world of, of, of people all over the world has changed um, mm -hmm. uh, through uh, the availability of, um, uh, of smartphones and... Uh, um, you know, in Africa, um, the, the many billions of people who have uh, uh, smartphones and they know about the world, they know what they're missing if they're very poor, um, uh, but they may not have toilets in their house. So, so th that's a development which has spread globally mm. very fast. And I think faster than uh, um, the people like McKinsey and other alleged pundits predicted. <laughs> uh, so it's been really, really fast. And so, so I think everyone would agree that the changes um, uh, are, are very uh, fast. And of course, there again, we don't know whether there's going to be a continued exponential change. Um, you know, is the metaverse really going to be a big change or not? You know, or, or will um, things level off? So that the iPhone 24 is more or less like the iPhone 14. You know, we, mm. we just don't, don't know which way it's going to go. Um, but uh, but I, I think we've had a, a huge global surge um, through all the implications of, uh, uh, of, of the of have IT. You, have, have you tried the metaverse? Have you have you have you tried VR and so on? Um, I haven't actually. I remember be, I remember being uh, actually in Caesar the first morning mm -hmm. when people were trying it, and that was when they didn't have all the safeguards in. I think well I think you. Perhaps you were there uh, mm. when um, uh, Sean was trying this, and um, uh, it was true. If you if you said, "Can you tell me how to build an H bomb?" It wouldn't give you the information. Right. But if you said, um, uh, "I'd like to write a play about someone trying to make an H bomb," mm. then it wouldn't give you the information. Right. And I think within a few hours they'd cured uh, that loophole. Yeah, um, no, we still and, have um, those problems. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think it clearly is going to transform education and things like mm -hmm. that. In fact, I was at Little Beatty this morning talking about the role of this in education and university exams and things of that kind, where, mm -hmm. it's, going to where, where it's going to really transform things. Yeah. Um, and it can be benign, but right. it's, it's going to uh, make a difference between the kind of things people have to learn. And yeah, talking about the... Um, to link it to the bioweapons thing earlier, there was, yeah, it, it, it still has the capability to say, yes, this is how you do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, they try to, yeah, they haven't kicked, they haven't yes, yes. solved all the problems, mm -hmm. solved all the problems there. Um, we, uh, there was another question that, uh, which was, how do you think people, I mean, I guess to get to this point about uh, mobile phones and so on, how do you think people can communicate effectively across widening generational gaps? Um, so, you know, I, I just think like, yeah, so this thing about, 
uh, Pug Walsh and, and Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, how do you think like, we should be, uh, you, know, uh, the gen you know, people here in this room who are interested mm. in these kinds of topics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how should we be thinking of ourselves in relation to, uh, in, in relation to previous generations, um, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. from the 40s or from the 70s and so on, who yes. were also interested in this? What lessons should we be taking? What kind of inspiration should we be taking? Yeah, I'd be interested. Yes. Well, I mean, of course, the, the past is a foreign country in a sense, right. and uh, the older generation, like me, uh, is, grew up in a different world. Um, but I think uh, it should be possible to bridge that barrier. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, people of, uh, of uh, young people who will be alive at the end of a century do right. care about the long term, and uh, older people care about the lives of their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think people uh, are aware that uh, you shouldn't discount the future in that sort of way, and one should think long term. And that's why the CISO agenda should be important to, to, to all these, these people. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it's very hard to bridge. But in fact, uh, this has another implication that um, I do think that things are changing more rapidly. And this is, I think, important for the effective altruism group because mm. um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the long-termism, which is a benign, um, uh, maxima benign principle, et cetera, um, that's uh, only effective if you can predict the uh, preferences and tastes of people in the future. And uh, uh, if things are, uh, are changing so much, mm. um, then uh, it's rather hard to predict what will be the preferences and what will be important. And, uh, uh, and we, should, uh, we should only um, give equal weight to these future people if we feel that we can decide what they are going to want as confident as we can decide what present day people want. Mm. So I think it is important. And the changes are, are much faster. I mean, I think within the last 20 years, they have been very fast. And um, uh, in my book, I quote as a, as a sort of metaphor and contrast, the cathedral builders um, mm. who, um, uh, who built, built cathedrals they wouldn't see finished in their, their lifetime. Um, and uh, they, so they, they planned a century ahead, um, even though their concept of the world was very limited in space and time. It was limited to Europe, and they thought the world might only last another thousand years. Mm. Um, uh, so why did they build these cathedrals, um, whereas we don't plan 100 years ahead? The answer is that they uh, thought that the lives of their children and grandchildren would be the same as theirs. Mm. They didn't expect change from one generation to the next, and so they were fairly confident that the young people, their children and grandchildren, would appreciate the Finnish cathedral. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think one of the problems for um, uh, effective altruism is we don't really know with the same confidence what the next one or two generations will want and will appreciate. And this is a, a big constraint on, um, uh, con on effective uh, choice of long-term priorities. So I guess that would, that could indicate like, well, we'll all we should be focusing on is, is reducing, you know, reducing the risk of catastrophes or collapse or extinction yes. or whatever, because you know, at least they might want to be existing and have the technical capacity yeah, yeah. to be able to choose or something. Yes, there's some things we can. I mean, I think yeah. uh, uh, in biodiversity. Well, don't use up all the resources uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, biodiversity, yeah. I mean, uh, our colleague, Sir Partha Desgupta, produced this 500 page report on preserving biodiversity, uh, which I think is a document as important as a stern report on climate change 15 years ago. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it's very important that we, we ensure that uh, high-tech agriculture can feed 9 billion people properly in 2050 without encroaching on more natural land and all that sort of thing. And uh, uh, I quote in my book, the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, who says that uh, um, if human activities lead to mass extinctions, it's a sin that future generations will least forgive us for, because that is an irreversible loss. And right. I think we can be fairly confident, um, uh, despite uncertainty about the preferences and tastes of future generations, that we'd be leaving them a depleted legacy mm. if we leave a, a, a world where the riches of nature has been destroyed. Do, do you think, like, uh, you know, presumably it's important, like, the current, gener current generation, just thinking about your children and so on, and, mm -hmm. and grandchildren, yeah. well, one's children and grandchildren, uh, would, like, you can justify reducing 
the ch chance of catastrophes and existential risks and so on, just with reference to today, do we, do, you, do we get anything? Like, what do we get by taking a longer view and considering future generations, do you think? Um, well, well, I think there's no, there's no conflict. I mean, if, mm. we, uh, if we plan to deal with climate change, then obviously that's going to be something which is done for the benefit of future generations. Mm. Um, but there's so, some risks and benefits which will be important 50 years from now, which we just can't predict, just as a, um, you know, when I was young, one couldn't have predicted. Um, you know, we thought we might have had flying cars by now, <laughs> but we didn't think that we would, we would have um, uh, um, you know, mobile phones giving the world information to everyone everywhere and all that. So uh, there are uncertainties um, in things you can predict. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as I say, this is a, this is a, a limit to long-term planning um, in some areas, and also I think affects the uh, the ethics of uh, of long-termism. Mm. How how much you uh, you weight the welfare of, of uh, future people? I mean, in principle, future lives are just as important as present lives. But in deciding what we do to improve them, uh, we can certainly do a lot for present generations. Um, but uh, we can't so obviously know we're doing the right thing for future generations. Uh, okay, well, I, I, I think we've just r run over time a little bit, mm. so uh, all that's left to say is thank you so much, Martin, for your time and sharing okay. your thoughts with us. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.